tonight is an amazing treat because we get to celebrate and be in dialogue with a brilliant scholar who is providing us with precisely the analysis that we need on many fronts for organizing in our workplaces, in our lives, and in our fights to save our limited democratic institutions. We want to give a big shout out to Anthony Arno and Haymarket, who is the publisher of our guest uh, of uh, his book, Elite Capture, and also of many other people who are on the Zoom call, me included. And Haymarket really played a wonderful role of facilitating this event. So I just wanna give a big shout out to them. Uh, tonight's Freedom School is gonna be run a little differently than some of our previous Freedom Schools. We're really gonna run it as a digital study circle. And so what that means is that we're going to have, we're inviting Professor Taiwo to engage with us, um, but we're gonna engage in dialogue where Todd Wolfson and I will be the hosts, but we're going to invite you also to participate in this dialogue. So think of this as a digital study circle. Uh, what goes along with that is just thinking about our solidarity practices, which is step up, step back. So if you are speaking a lot, uh, be conscious of that. We wanna make sure that everyone gets a chance to get in. We ask for people to make individual comments of three minutes. Um, you can participate multiple times, but just be aware of other people. So uh, step up if you're not speaking much and step back if you find yourself speaking a lot. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing my co-host, Todd Wilson, who is the former president of our union and the current vice president. And he is also one of the founders of Higher Education Labor United, which I hope we'll get a chance to talk about tonight, which is absolutely essential in our fights for solidarity, both at Rutgers and thinking about the larger labor movement that we are all a part of. I just want to give a real shout out to both Todd and our president, uh, Becky, who, uh, Becky Given, who have just done amazing work leading our union in a very, very difficult time, steering us through the pandemic, the fight for work share and solidarity across job categories, and now in our current contract campaign. So I'm going to turn it over to Todd, who's going to introduce our speaker. Hey, everyone, it's great to see you all. Um, what a great night. Uh, thank you so much, Donna, for organizing this fabulous event and to our amazing staff. Um, I have the great honor of getting to, to introduce our amazing speaker. But before I do, while we have all of you here captured, so to speak, I'm going to give you an update on the contract campaign really brief so folks know where things stand. And then we'll we'll get into the event. Um, so as, of, as, as Donna said, as of July 1, I'd say about approximately 15,000 workers at Rutgers um, have been working without a contract. That's almost all the healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, techs, that um, uh, professional staff at the university, um, that's uh, residents back in the healthcare uh, system, that's all faculty, full-time non-tenure, track faculty, uh, full-time tenure track faculty, adjunct, sorry, what he's itching himself, um, grad workers, postdocs, um, 15,000 of us have been working, I'm sorry if I missed um, uh, important positions, EOF counselors, 15,000 of us have been working without a contract since July 1. And, and I want to underline that management has chosen not to come to the bargaining table for over the last two months. We had, we had our first bargaining session since sometime maybe in July or August, I can't remember uh, when, this week. So it's been almost two months without bargaining. Um, we have proposed, in our union, we've proposed something like uh, 33 articles, some, some number in that number, and they either rejected out of hand all of our major transformational demands, or they have not responded to them yet. Um, and that's not just our union, that's every single union that's bargaining with management. Management is intransigent and they are not ready to actually move forward this workplace in the interest of all of us, in the interest of workers and students. And so we have come together and we're bargaining in tight um, 
tightly aligned with our adjunct faculty and with our medical faculty who have both made a demand to join our union and also in alignment with our professional staff and our healthcare unions. Um, and we're all working very closely together here and we have made transformational demands. We are putting out demands that say Rutgers must change. Everything from raises that are big in the moment of extreme inflation to critical demands to make sure the workforce is treated with dignity and respect and has more long-term security for our adjunct faculty, for our grad workers, for our non-tenure track faculty, and for our professional staff. And then we've also made critical demands around democracy in the workplace and making sure the university actually believes in shared governance with us and doesn't impose new systems like Course Atlas. And then we also are making demands around racial equity, gender equity, and campus equity, among many other things. And so if we're going to win these demands, if we're going to transform this university together, um, we're going to need to all stand up and show um, the administration that we are organized and we're ready to fight for them. And so that's the stage we're in. It's a great and exciting stage. And we want folks to step into that together with power when we tell them what we need and we're going to win it together. Um, so that's where we're at in the contract campaign. And I'm going to pivot now uh, because it is my fantastic pleasure to move us into this wonderful event on Elite Capture. So I'm going to introduce Olufemi Taiwo, um, who is our main speaker tonight. And we are so lucky to have you. Thank you for joining us. Olufemi is an associate professor of philosophy at Georgetown University. His work focuses on Africana and social political philosophy and emphasizes themes and figures from anti-capitalist, anti-colonial, and Black radical traditions of thought and practice. He's also author of Reconsidering Reparations and Elite Capture, um, and he is a former member, steward, both steward and rank and file member, uh, as a graduate worker of UAW2865, which is the grad workers in the University of California system, which I'll remind everyone, 36,000, 36,000 of UAW grad workers, academic researchers, and student researchers and postdocs yesterday finished a strike vote and voted 98% in favor of a strike and could go out. 36,000 might be the biggest strike we'll see in years, could go out um, together and as soon as uh, November 14th. What a fabulous union uh, you come out of, uh, Ofemi. So from there, I'm gonna pass it back to you, but we're so excited to have you with us. So welcome. I'll pass it to you, Donna, actually. Thank you so much for that introduction, Todd. And yes, very, very exciting about UC uh, grad students. Back in 1998, I was a rank and file member of the grads when we organized a union and we went out for over three weeks, including a grade strike. And um, this takes me back and it's exciting to hear that ongoing radicalism and activism at UC and where the faculty, unlike Rutgers, do not have a union. So um, why don't we just jump right in? Um, your new book, um, Professor Taiwo Femi, uh, elite capture, how the powerful took over identity politics and everything else. I have to say, I love the every and everything else has had such enormous influence because of its brilliance and insight into our current political dilemmas in the United States, spanning from the 10 year anniversary of the Ferguson and BLM protests take off to the kinds of struggles we are facing in higher education. Can you talk about the concept of elite capture and what brought you to write about it? Yeah, so so first of all, thanks so much, uh, Donna and Todd and Alan and Sherry and everybody else who put this together. Thanks everybody for showing up. I'm really glad to get to talk to a union that I'm really, you know, trying to learn a lot from. We're gonna get to do a little back and forth later. Um, so so you'll see that I really mean that, but um I'm really excited and made hopeful by the stuff that y'all have been up to and hope that that's something that can catch on. So, you know, I, I, I'm really glad to get to talk to everybody. Um, so to answer the question, um, why did I come to this idea of elite capture um, and what made me start 
thinking in these terms. It's a combination of stuff I was experiencing on the organizing side of things, uh, both in you know some of the conversations we were having um, in UAW 2865, that should we go for this, should we go for that? Um, and other organizing that I was involved in in LA. Um, it seemed like, you know, there was a sort of clash of cultures about how we should decide who to listen to in these conversations and, you know, all the kinds of dynamics I'm sure everybody here is familiar with, right? You know, um, we, on the one hand, we want to take seriously particular ways that people are um, oppressed and treated unfairly under the current system, but there's a question about what taking those specific aspects of injustice seriously means at the level of actually doing concrete organizing, and I think importantly, actually winning at doing concrete organizing, right, which is not just about being heard, but which is about, you know, getting strategy to work and all the things that um, I think we all are familiar with. So on the organizing experience side, that's where the desire came from. And then on the kind of intellectual, you know, on the nerd side of things, um, one of the things that people were using to articulate why they think politics should go a certain way um, are were ideas having to do with representation, right? So if um, there's the right kind of people in our um, organizing spaces or in government positions, um, then we expect better things to happen, they seem to say. And, you know, I don't think that's totally wrongheaded, but on the other hand, um, I think we've seen over the past few years how even um, people who are Black or Indigenous or uh, people of this gender presentation or that one can end up, you know, doing the work of the system that we don't like, right? So intellectually, I was trying to say, this is a thing that I think the left has long understood. Um, but how is it that we make this case to people who don't necessarily have the ideas that we do or, you know, look at history in the way that uh, the organized left does? And I came up with this um, idea, um, or rather, I found this idea that people were already using of elite capture, and I thought that actually explains this phenomenon that I'm thinking about pretty well. Um, I, I know Donna has some questions for me about that and we have some you know, uh, shared glee at using a term that's been um, used in development studies for this different purpose. Um, so maybe I'll leave it there for now. Donna, you're muted. Oh dear, I was gonna keep going on and on while on mute. Um, but we were talking about this right before about this radical intervention of the book that using the concept of elite capture that had really been used in development studies to talk about the global South in particular and failed development strategies in which you had elite strata essentially that had captured state resources and diverted it for its own um, benefit and that radical appropriation of that that's used to talk about failed states in contrast to Western wealthy countries, uh, to apply that actually to us and to this you know, core problem. And I think it is a testament to the analysis how much it has taken off because in many ways, I'll say in my own life, this is maybe the most profound period of elite capture that I've seen. And it's certainly a trajectory I would say from the Obama administration, but it it's for many reasons, I think it has, it is a problem in so many of our different institutions, including historical public institutions that should be places of the common good and places of redistribution. So that's uh, what we'll get to talk about today. I thought before we sort of get into some of the organizing discussions, I just wanted to drill down a little bit and to talk about your use of one of my favorite books, 
uh, E. Franklin Frazier's Black Bourgeoisie, which was written in 1962 and written by a black leftist who did such important analysis, was not always good on the gender tip, also helped provide some of the scholarship that Daniel Patrick Moynihan later drew on, but his radical analysis about black class politics at mid-century as a way to think about how to insert class analysis into African-American politics and that question of where elites fit in a community that's perceived as subaltern. So can you talk about Frank, uh, E. Franklin Frazier, where he fits within your thought and how, what, how he argued about how elite black class politics affects working class people and those from less privileged strata, but in the same group. Yeah, I was, I was really glad to um, get to talk about E. Franklin Frazier because he's one of these um, really interesting figures that I, I, I think it makes a lot of sense that you point out the connection between him and Moynihan, which you know maybe leftists afterwards don't like so much, but a lot of the analysis that he put forward, I think is pretty friendly to ways that we think about the world. Um, so maybe I'll just take a second and just say um, for anyone who um, is maybe hearing this term for the first time, you know, what is it that I mean by elite capture? Um, and then why I found Frazier so helpful for thinking about it. Um, so I think the easiest way to think about elite capture is to just think of regular old resource inequality. So when we say inequality, I think usually what people mean is resource inequality. Like there's so many dollars in the world and Jeff Bezos has a bunch of them. And inequality is the difference between how many dollars Bezos has and how many dollars the rest of us have. Right, so we're just, you know, counting stuff, dollars, or maybe acres of land, um, and, or, or maybe votes in a multinational institution like the World Bank. And all those will give us ways of thinking about inequality, which is just the haves have more than the have nots of some resource. And elite capture is a very nearby idea to that. Um, I think you could think of elite capture as practical inequality. So who finds it easier to do stuff in society? Um, so obviously if you have a lot of land or a lot of dollars, it's gonna be easier for you to do things in the world. Um, and if we're paying attention, we think we might ask some questions about which things the people with dollars and land are gonna do. They might buy research institutions. They might buy media outlets. They might buy politicians, right? And change the actual rules of society to fit the way that they think that things should be. So uh, an initial advantage in a number of dollars becomes a much more general kind of social advantage in figuring out how the world is gonna work. So that's elite capture. It's um, related to this other sense of inequality, but a little bit different. And it's that, kind of thing that I think E. Franklin Frazier was zeroed in on. So on the one hand, in the book Black Bourgeoisie, he wants to say there are real differences in the interests and the political goals of the most economically advantaged strata of Black people, the Black bourgeoisie, right? Um, they um, have different political goals, they advocate for different political goals, and you see that in the things that they do. Um, when they, you know, one of the examples he gives is of a Black doctor who got accepted to the American Medical Association but opposed socialized medicine, right? It's like, well, if you're thinking about what would be good for Black people in healthcare, you want socialized medicine, but if you're thinking about what would be good for the particular strata of black people that get to say run a newspaper, um, maybe it's more important to them to be seen, to, to integrate this prestigious professional class organization and so on and so forth, right? So that gives you a general flavor of the kind of thing he's talking about. Um, but what's interesting about Frazier in particular, um, and one of the reasons I found his book so helpful in thinking about it is, you know, we shouldn't take this criticism of 
um, the advantage strata of black people in this case or any given oppressed people too far, right? Where it flies free of a power analysis. You know, for all of Frazier's criticisms of the black bourgeoisie, and he has a lot of them, and I don't think all of them are necessarily fair, uh, but for all of his criticisms, one of the things he acknowledges in the book is this is a lumpen bourgeoisie, right? Unlike the actual bourgeoisie, um, they can't change laws on a dime. They can't buy up whole research institutions and direct their activity. They can't direct whole food systems or energy systems. If you put all of the Black people who are of the um, business owning strata together in the country, you would have an amount of capital that represented less than the average white local bank at the time he wrote this, right? And so he's trying to both say, we need to grapple with real political divisions in the black community. Um, but if we are serious and evidence-based and empirical about what those divisions amount to, we, we can reconcile that with a recognition of the broader racial injustice that explains the whole system that confronts Black people in general, including the Black bourgeoisie. So I found that balance really uh, helpful in orienting the book. Donnie, you're muted again. You're muted again. So sorry. Um, Todd, would you like to give our next question? Absolutely. So your book has done an amazing job of talking about elite capture and the effects it's had on grassroots struggle and in many different contexts. Um, so can you take a minute and talk about your understanding and use of solidarity, solidarity as an antidote to, to elite capture? Um, and we're really interested to hear how you understand the importance of forging, like what we're trying to do here, um, forging coalitions across difference. Um, so yeah, we, we'd love to hear how, how that's a real solution. Yeah, and, and I'm looking forward to hearing from y'all how it's working there. Um, but what I was thinking when I um, talked about solidarity as an antidote to elite capture is I think there is a sort of political orienting effect of trying to do broad-based coalitional work. One of... I think one of the one of the examples of you know successful grassroots coalitional struggle is the sort of transnational workers organizing against apartheid, right, which happened throughout um, the eighties and nineties, and I think. What you see when you have broad-based organizing is a sort of natural tendency to lead with the to lead with the actual high stakes political issues. Like what elite capture comes down to at base is a kind of capture over priorities of movements. So um, to go back to the Fraser example that we talked about just a second ago, you know, if there's a broad black and brown and white and all, you know, whatever, everybody who gets healthcare, coalition for healthcare, um, it will be harder to convince everybody that what's required for making the healthcare system better is the inclusion of a few well-paced positions at the American Medical Association, All right? Because just fewer people are in the part of the world where that's, you know, are in the part of the social system where that's a compelling thing to fight for. And so I think the kinds of 
movement priorities that emerge when the groups get larger, I think are the kinds of movement priorities that speak to concerns that more people have. And it's the anti-coalitional, anti-solidaristic tendencies that I think play most into elite capture. It's in the smaller groups where um, the most advantaged people within a oppressed class are likeliest to be able to monopolize the group's attention and resources and movement. Thank you so much for that. Um, I was thinking that this might be a place if we maybe wanted to have a little bit of dialogue about thinking about solidarity and where it fits into let's say our struggle in higher education. Um, Femi, do you wanna get us started? Yeah, so one question that I had for y'all um, when I was trying to think about what to say tonight um, is the relationship that you all have to the admins at Rutgers. And so, you know, this is something I've read a little bit about, but obviously you all know more, but, you know, I understand that there's a lot of black firsts at the administrative level in the Rutgers system. Um, President Jonathan Hallway is just, is just one of those, right? Um, and it's actually a case that's a lot like the E. Franklin Fraser case, you might think, um, or I suppose that's my question. Right. On the one hand, you have um, the first kind of Black figures to be at this level of the administrative hierarchy, and in some sense, maybe that is a success. Um, but on the other hand, at least some of the leadership decisions made at that level have worked against, you know, your, for example, your union's vision for pay equity. Um, there's been in the wake of the pandemic, some austerity measures leveled at workers, and those workers are black and brown too, right? Uh, or many of them are black and brown, right? So we've been talking about this kind of concept of elite capture. Is that the thing that you think applies in the Rutgers administration case, or do you think that's not quite what's going on? So um, would anyone like to participate, put their name in stack? Uh, I can get us started, but I wanna make sure that we get, you know, have a, a genuine study circle. We get to exchange and share different ideas. And uh, when you participate, identify yourself with your name, uh, with your position, your, what we call your job category, your campus uh, and your department. I would say just to just to get things started, I think that we're in a complex moment at Rutgers. We are in the the pandemic is of course ongoing, but we are in the aftermath of the the immediate and urgent crisis of the pandemic, which at Rutgers was particularly brutal because of our proximity to New York. So that when COVID hit, it hit like just a hurricane, a tsunami of illness and job loss. And with job loss came the loss of health insurance. So we've had this happen simultaneously, this enormous crisis, you know, public health, global pandemic, public health crisis. But at the same time, we've had a representational first, which is our first African-American president. And I think there has been the last two years, two and a half years have been a time of unprecedented occurrences. And I think that uh, to fast forward to where we are right now is that very recently, uh, our president, Jonathan Holloway, has taken a very hardline public stance against the union. There was a real hope and we really reached out to Jonathan Holloway. Our previous president was a Republican who had ties to Chris Christie. We still have many people who really run the university and the administration with ties to Chris Christie. 
Um, and there was a real desire and excitement about having both our first black president and having a historian, an historian who has written about a Abram Harris and um, some of the other essentially black leftist kind of black left liberals uh, in the 1930s about the real possibilities of that and seeing that as hopefully a break from the politics of the past. But what we have seen is the continued retention of Jackson Lewis of an anti-labor law firm, continued opposition to pay equity. And more recently, we've seen a very public stance in which our own president has said, and I quote in the State of the University speech, that equal pay for equal work is a powerful concept, but is more complex in practice, by which he meant both pay equity and a core part of the way pay equity has been implemented at Rutgers is on the basis of an structural inequity based on gender and on campus. And also the question of how part-time lecturers, teaching faculty are paid relative to non-tenure track full-time faculty and tenure track full-time faculty. So you had a, a very public statement against equal pay as equal work. And we were really shocked by this. And it's, it's also in this moment of seeing it that you know we've turned to think about your analysis. Um, so I'd say that's just to kind of fast forward and get us to talk about kind of the moment that we're in where we have not had a contract. We continue to have an anti-labor law firm retained. And I think one could even argue that the setting up of a new institution called OULR, and other people can talk about this in more detail because the details matter, that I think that some of the lawyers and the uh, parts of the administration that date back, that can trace themselves back to this earlier 10 year period, that they've been given new powers in order to negotiate with the union. So we are, um, we are dealing with that and dealing with the reality of things, seeing things that have been common practice stripped out like providing people sabbaticals upon retirement, like the general counsel getting involved in many different parts of the university in ways that are unprecedented. So that's my attempt just to open and start the discussion. I see that we have Ileana on stack. Thank you so much. And I was actually hoping that um, I'd give uh, Professor Taiwo uh, the chance to answer first because my question is in a kind of goes in a different direction, but I still wanted to ask it. So I don't know how you'd like to proceed from here. No, why don't we hold off on that? Because I just wanted us to get a chance for all of us to respond to his question, and then we'll come back to you, Ileana. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There are a couple comments in the chat from uh, Jasmine and Ed. Um, I don't know if either of them want to chime in verbally. Would either of you feel comfortable uh, speaking? It'll make it so much easier. We can read your comment if you don't feel comfortable. I want to get, um, this is Jasmine speaking. Sorry, my video is not on everyone, but I'm really glad to be here. Um, my comment is because I'm not at Rutgers, I'm not in your institution, but I'm in an institution that is experiencing something very, very similar. I am a professor, a tenure track professor at the only public university in our, in the nation's capital, um, University of the District of Columbia. And our administration is, in, is, is dragging their feet and engaging in bad faith over our negotiation for our contract. So I do fear and I see that what happened at Rutgers last summer um, and that the fact that you have been without a contract and working without a contract is something that's going to happen to us very, very, very soon. And it has a lot to do with um, what I see as decades of gutting uh, any kind of practice of negotiations between administration and faculty around labor issues, um, a lot of turnover in administration and turnover in faculty, so lack of institutional memory and practice of actually sitting, you know, and having a conversation about what, what we want to have happen. So I'm just really grateful to be here. And I wanted to say that 
to Femi that his book is so instrumental for us in so many ways. And I think that this opens a conversation and I, I appreciate the concept because it allows us to really grab on to um, the issues that are at hand. So thank you so much for letting me join the conversation. I think next we have Howie on staff. Hi, uh, I'm Howie Swerloff and I'm uh, an adjunct at the in the writing program in New Brunswick and uh, secretary of the adjunct union. And Femi, I haven't read your book. I just bought it uh, while we're talking here and I, I hope to read it. So I hope I'm not going to go too far afield. But uh, to Donna's uh, little history, I, I could add to, to that. And um, so Holloway was hired in the context of uh, Black Lives Matter movement. It, you know, at the height of it, it he, he his tenure uh, coincides with that heightened consciousness around the country, right? Un, un, to use that word again, unprecedented consciousness of racism and and the role that it plays in all of our institutions and uh so as although i don't think too many people here tonight probably had many illusions about what he was going to do i think there was um there were some illusions among let's say let's say liberals who are who make up a good percentage of our of our faculty um well-meaning people who uh, were moved by the events of that of that summer and um, and and saw this as as a constructive uh, uh, step on the part of the university and did things like you know it, it took uh, Holloway's writing and introduced it into or planning to introduce it into the writing program curriculum for freshmen something which horrified some of us who work there as you can imagine um, but. I think that the experience of the pandemic and um, and of the the attacks on uh, on workers in general over the since then have uh, will it remains to be seen. But my prediction is that this this isn't going to work. This uh, tactic on the part of the same conservative uh, administration that we had under with Barkey, right? They're still they're still here in place and, and running the place for all practical purposes. I, my, my sense of it is it's not going to work that uh, we see through this. And uh, of course, we were we were very tentative about attacking him in any way. Right. For a while, it did set us back a bit in the beginning. But I think now that he's shown his his true nature and uh, and and all of us have suffered a bit uh, that this is going to this is worn thin. And um, so our taxes taxes have changed accordingly. So I hope that uh, helps further this conversation. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much, Howie. Uh, next, we have Amber Joseph on stack and be sure to you know provide your name and all your info. Hi, um, my name is Amber Joseph. I am I'm she, her, hers. Uh, I am a first year creative writing MFA uh, student at Rutgers Camden. Um, so I was, I'm happy to be here. Um, I was I was initially like hesitant to speak because I just got here literally. Um, but one thing I will say is that I think it's important when we think about Jonathan Holloway to like think about like where he's come from. Um, like the institutions that he came from before Rutgers. Um, he was at Yale um, and I think he went to Northeastern after that. But when he was at Yale, I was an undergrad student there. Um, and this is right at the cusp of the, the controversy and eventually renaming of Calhoun College. Um, and also the, a lot of things changed, but he was the master of Calhoun College um, because when I was there, the term was still used. Now it's head of the college. And, you know, I think when we were there, we all understood that he, he, he was the first black master of Calhoun College and we all understood him to be kind of a, a person who was put in that space to kind of like ameliorate a lot of the, the side eye and the conversation. Um, I'm happy to say that, you know, when I, it was brewing when I left, but it definitely um, reached like a kind of like crescendo and then, you know, famously like a dining hall worker like smashed a window in Calhoun College um, because that window had depicted um, enslaved people picking cotton. 
And so, you know, Holloway was was very he was very torn about the renaming, you know, um, and he went on record saying that for a very long time. And so while I don't necessarily like I, I don't feel like comfortable like indicting him wholeheartedly yet because I like I, I just came into the space and I'm I'm also trying to understand Rutgers. I, I will say that I think what he's doing now isn't shocking to me um, because he's a person who has navigated as, as a first for a very long time, um, incredibly exclusionary, incredibly elite white spaces. Um, and so I, 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 I can't, I, I, I don't know what else to say besides the fact that, you know, he, he, what, he, he never struck me as like a particularly radical person. Um, and so to be at the helm of a university that, you know, is making demands of him very early that are very explicit and also probably very messy. Um, you know, I was talking to somebody a couple of weeks ago and they described him as being very like slick and very media trained. Um, and, you know, I mean, he, 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 com he comes from a very specific kind of world. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious just to like sit back and listen more about like how others perceive him who've been here for a while, but I'm not particularly like surprised you know, that that an elite capture kind of accusation can be like levied against him because I mean, he just, he was the master of Calhoun College for many years and, you know, sat in that dining hall. So for what it's worth. Femi, we have two more people on stack. Do you wanna respond or should I go to the other two people on stack? Let me say something briefly just so we can keep the stack flowing but just i i totally you know this is part of the kind of love hate relationship i have with fraser because because i am you know i do kind of agree with amber that if you're trying to make it about these people like i don't i don't know jonathan hallway i don't have any sense of what his real motivations are and i i just don't feel like it's necessary or maybe even, yeah, I don't feel like it's necessary to feel like the elite capture, the accusation of elite capture is like an indictment of this person, right? Like, you know, who knows? Who knows what's going on in his life, right? But I think what's more important is, you know, what what you and others have said around the kind of background of what the administration is trying to do which includes this person, includes a lot of other people, includes institutional factors, right? Like, what is the, what is Rutgers as at the administration level trying to do in response to the union politics, in response to the challenges it's getting from workers? And I think that's maybe the thing that we should wonder about using the phrase elite capture or whatever other phrase we want. Thank you so much. So we have Sebastian and Wendell on stack. Good evening and thank you so much for this for this gathering. Um, I identify with a lot of what's been said so far. And um, my, oh, by the, sorry, my name is Sebastian, uh, Latino and Caribbean Studies Assistant Professor um, and in the Criminal Justice Program at Rutgers, New Brunswick. So um, I agree with with the historical depiction of what what seemed like a honeymoon period when the presidency just started and the ideas of hope and expectations of a different climate. There is, um, I personally felt it and I've seen it in different forms, this kind of, it's um, a reluctance. It's also a different kind of personal um, solidarity politics where when you when the person in the at the helm in that office is not just a person of color but a black person the way that critiques are leveraged there's um like a, a particular ethical relationship to that and a personal biographical relationship to that that people will obviously vary on but <clears throat> i think what what has resonated with me quite a bit is that there's this in like an, in an intra group setting, nobody can finesse or sell you out quite like your own group. And I think that 
a lot of things like uh, Kaepernick, Nike type of, you know, J Fortune 100, Fortune 500 type of um, corporate social responsibility type of uh, finesse work or marketing work. I think that you, that paired with the fact that we don't know what people have had to go through or endure to get to the positions that they're in and what they've gained and lost along the way. But my my whole thing, and I saw it in the chat too, the hashtag it's structural, is that what is in Holloway's heart or in his mind or in his biography or whether he was held enough as a as an infant or whatever, like all of that, all of those details are so secondary because the 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 real thing is what the office of the presidency of an increasingly corporatized university is expected to do, rewarded for doing, incentivized to do. Um, and I think just having the antenna out that an administration that is demographically different, and to Amber's point, like being the first in a particular type of context, that comes with PR advantages, but comes with power dynamics that fundamentally change, where a Holloway administration can do things that a Barchi administration might have not been able to do in the same type of way. So I think that that challenge of how to responsibly get at that, but also not get lost in that either because it is the office of the presidency whoever's in it that is going to be kind of they got that job because they're willing able prepared qualified and demonstrably well equipped to do what the office of that presidency is expected to do and that does not align with labor that aligns with uh capital so um thank you for for the time and i'm going to step back thank you so much sebastian so on stack, we have Wendell and Becky, and then Femi, we also have a question for you. Hi, uh, my name is Wendell Marsh, uh, Rutgers Newark, uh, Africana Studies Assistant Professor. And I guess I have more of a question than a kind of response to uh, your question, Professor Tao. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I'm someone who's I've been at Rutgers for a few years now, but they've all been pandemic years, so I don't even know if they really count <laughs> as far as knowing the institution. I feel like I'm um, don't really understand what what's going on or understand the culture. And so my kind of question that I have thinking about this conversation is if elite capture is a useful concept for thinking um, the kind of naming of Holloway as president, what are the, can we name or describe uh, the kind of uh, interests that he represents of, um, so thinking with um, Frazier in your example, that there's a specific set of interests being represented by the few Black doctors who go in to um, medical boards, what what do we see being the um, advantage being pursued by the kind of Black elite group that we are describing as capturing uh, university resources? If I've understood the concept. Yeah, so I take it that it's, I mean, there's basically two things. One, there is regular kind of naked personal self-interest, right? So, you know, if you're in a doctor on the AMA board, then that means that you, you know, get certain professional privileges and maybe make a little bit more money. I assume something like that is true for university administration, presumably. Holloway gets a salary and, you know, maybe he gets into some fancy rooms with some fancy people and maybe on the back end of this salary is an even better one later when, you know, he's the Ida B. Wells chair of J.P. Morgan Chase Bank or whatever, you know, like, however, however it is that that world works, I don't understand it, so I won't pretend to, but so there's the personal interest level and then the collective version of that, and here's where the class politics elite caps are supposed to play in, is that if you're not Holloway himself, but if you're, you know, a VP of diversity, equity, inclusion, who might stand to gain from that kind of person being visible, if you are, 
an administrator, um, a black administrator at, you know, at Princeton or at, um, you know, a state school that is nearby that looks to Rutgers as a peer institution and says, you know, we got to do what Rutgers is doing. Um, and you're a black administrator who might get promoted on the back of that kind of judgment, right? There's a, you know, you might want to stand in a kind of class solidarity with Holloway if you're one of those sorts of people. And all Lee Capture is trying to do is say, well, there, there are, you know, a group of people, may, whether we want to call them a class or not, you know, we can argue about, but there's a fraction of Black people for whom it really is good in a kind of standard sense of good interest that Holloway gets to this position. It's not just good for Holloway. It's good for people like Holloway amongst the Black people. Um, and that is a you know, that has political ramifications, the kind that we've been talking about, the kind of Sebastian really, I think, helpfully kind of talked us through. Um, and if that's what, and here's where the, at the end of all that, here's where the elite capture comes in. If the ascension of Holloway and the ascension of all these Holloway-like people is the administration's response to the 2020 protests and to the pressure on higher ed, that's coming from black politics writ large, you know, black politics, including Ferguson, black politics, including, you know, Minnesota, that sounds, that's starting to sound like an elite capture story to me. Um, and that's why I think it would be useful to think through whether that's right or not, obviously we can talk about, but that's how I'm thinking about it. Thank you so much, Becky. Yeah, I, um... First of all, thank you so much, Femi. This is just so um, helpful and useful to be in this conversation and to have this really great <laughs> apt lens for thinking about what we're what we're all dealing with. I wanted to ask or just sort of bring out a little bit. I think there's. Um, and I say this as a white tenured faculty member, I think the thing that I won't face, among other things, with all the structural inequities we, we swim in every day, is for faculty of color who resist, right? There's an opportunity to gain, to be willing to do the bidding of the sort of neoliberal project. And for faculty, many of whom we're hearing from tonight, who say, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to continue to live my values and, you know, put solidarity first. I think there are, you know, professional consequences. There are opportunities that you, you do not or cannot take. Um, and I think, I think that's significant. And I think those of us who are white in the neoliberal university never, never face that trade-off and those consequences. And I think it's, um, I just kind of, I, I would like to hear your thoughts if that seems, if that seems an, an, a, a fair description. And um, yeah, and in terms of, you know, there's this real bifurcation of, of these paths where you, you, you know, there are, there are people who have that opportunity who say no, and as a result, uh, face, you know, professional consequences and, and um, that's, it's, it's a concern and I, I don't think I fully gotten my head around it, but I, I'd love your thoughts. And let me know if I'm uh, getting anything about your question wrong, but I think my instinct, you know, intuitively it seems like it's a question of the intensity of the negative consequences rather than like white professors not having them at all or flying free of them and professors of color, you know, having all of them. I think it, you know, but in general, I think there is a strong, there's a strong disincentive to buck the kind of neoliberal trend of higher ed for anybody. Um, tenure track or not, tenured or not. Um, and the the big kind of, the big differences between us are what kinds of protections that we have. 
right? So tenure, of course, being the big one, but beyond that, you know, what kind of support we can expect from our colleagues, which is um, a lot of times different for professors of color, especially on the junior side, um, what kinds of um, support we can have across disciplines. Some disciplines are in and of themselves prestigious. You know, I think um, physicists are going to be taken differently than classicists if they speak out about these sorts of things. And that's, you know, it's part of the weird internal politics of academia that we have to now navigate when trying to figure this out. Um, but yeah, I think at the end of the day, um, anybody who is trying to be in meaningful solidarity with other people on campus as workers, not just other people on campus, but really as workers, um, anybody who is trying to do what you all have done and um, start a, you know, start organizing, um, I, I think there's going to be something to pay on the administrative side. And, you know, it's kind of a race to see if we can organize faster than they can roll out those consequences. But, you know, clearly it's possible because you all have done it. So, yeah. Thank you so much for that question, Becky. Um, so I thought we would pivot maybe with our uh, final question to you, and then we have our free form discussion. Um, you know, it's so clear from this discussion and also from having read your work, how much it is informed by real life organizing. And so we wanted to hear more about both your history of organizing and things that you're doing today and that kind of relationship between action and thought. So broadly, it's, it's actually funny. Um, the image that you used for this event is the image that I think we used for our first event of uh, an, act, uh, an organizing group I was in called the Undercommons. Um, a bunch of grad students um, who were, uh, I guess, a little on the rowdier side decided to um, have a sort of I don't even know what I would call it. I guess freedom school, you know, I guess, yeah, freedom school is how we kind of styled ourselves. But basically we gave, we found a loudspeaker and uh, found a really public part of campus and had alternative classes that we um, blared out on the speaker um, a couple of times a week. And that let us bring in um, a lot of people from, off campus in the broader LA organizing scene um, and let us make a bunch of cool connections between kind of student campus activism and stuff that was happening in the city around union organizing, around organizing um, against transphobia and queerphobia, um, some of the anti-racist organizing that was happening, some of the anti-police organizing that was happening. Um, and that was, something I spent a lot of uh, my time in LA doing. Um, as we said earlier, um, I was uh, rank and file for most years. For a couple of years, I was a steward in UAW 2865, which is the um, academic workers union for the University of California college system. Um, and let's see, um, one of the big, one of the other places that I spent most time organizing, um, especially in LA, um, though I'm still a member now over here, um, was in DSA. Um, specifically in um, LA, I was doing a lot of um, immigration justice organizing. Um, so working with um, some other kind of coalitional groups, uh, National Day Laborers Network, um, um, and uh, ICE out of LA and those kinds of groups. Um, so that's my background organizing wise. But I think honestly, the thing that I learned most 
from doing organizing as, as far as theory goes is how I don't want to, I don't want to put this dismissively or anti-intellectually, but like how unimportant theory is, you know, and, and I, I want to be clear about what I mean by that, you know, I, like, I think it's important to know stuff and, you know, think about things seriously. That's not something that we get out of doing just because we're willing to do sit-ins, right? You know, we have to pick the right targets, all those sorts of things. I, I think it's important to do theory, but the kinds of debates and discussions and I think maybe most importantly, the kinds of conflict that we get into on on the basis of different kinds of, I mean, essentially different lists of favorite books is, is really at odds with the kind of things that actually turn out to be important in organizing spaces. You know, I, I, I joked a lot with friends about this. You know, I, I go into academic rooms and you get the impression that what's really important is figuring out like, which Ru Russian Marxist came up with the absolute theory of everything, but in the organizing world, what's far more important is whether or not you remembered to bring chips. Um, and it turns out that <laughs> organizing is really more about like doing stuff for people and listening to people, like actually listening to understand the things that they're saying to you, not listening in the way a debater listens. So, you know, I, I won't, belabor the point anymore but that is the biggest thing that i learned from organizing thank you so much um and i thought at this point it might be interesting for us just to have a discussion about brass tax questions about building union coalitions in this moment um thinking about how to build across job category across campus and the visions of how to how to build a kind of 21st century industrial unionism um, in higher ed. Uh, we're interested also in unions and labor organizing across the board, but thinking about what the different kinds of challenges are. And Femi, do you want to get us started? And then we can kind of go around the study circle. Um. I have some stuff to say about that, but I, I think um, Ileana was on stack from before. I want to make sure uh, they get to say what they have to say. Thank you for that. I'm so sorry, Ileana. I put you on the list and then lost you. Okay, that's absolutely fine. No, I know. I know that I just have to say stack, you know, like, and you guys are going to respond. So I'm not worried about that. But um, so actually, my question was more about, you know, like the sort of like theoretical aspect. And I feel like almost like I feel like I have to put it in because I, I taught your book in my feminist theory class. And uh, that was the first assignment. I was like, identify ways in which identity politics is misused, you know, like, and they responded, my students responded really well. But my question to you, and I don't know if this is relevant to this discussion, maybe um, um, building on what Amber said earlier, but can you think of instances where, you know, like your concept, either, you know, like uh, um, deference politics or identity or, uh, or, you know, like elite capture or other concepts, you know, uh, um, have constructive politics have been misused and you felt that, you know, like you were totally misunderstood. These people are not getting it, you know, like, and and because maybe that, that can help us th think through that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I have seen, you know, I've I've made the mistake. I'm of, taking uh, notes here. Sorry for my yeah. <laughs> okay. so, I, so I've um I've uh I've made the mistake of being on Twitter, a mistake that I continually remake. Um, but you know, some of the some of the things that I've seen people use elite capture to respond to that that strike me as a misuse. Um, are uh, people? Let me let me put it this way: people identifying like entire categories of demands, or yeah, entire categories of movement demands as being, you know, evidence of elite capture or embodying elite capture. I think is more the thing, you know. Like if you even talk about anti-racism to some people who are more on the 
class reductionist side of things, I guess, um, that to some people might, that might strike some people as elite capture, right? Because, you know, if you were really oppressed, the only thing you would care about is, um, you know, uh, getting healthcare and getting um, wage increases and combating inflation, you know, whatever the list is of approved topics. And that's a use that I've seen of elite capture that I felt like was a misuse. And uh, I think a similar kind of thing gets done with constructive politics. So I think people are right to feel like there is a sort of universalist direction of the ideas that are in the book, but they take universalism to mean like if there's a if there is a movement demand that doesn't literally apply to everyone, then it's sectarian and anti-coalitional and anti-solidaristic. Um, so some of the responses to the um, reproductive rights organizing that I've seen has been, you know, this is a distraction from the real stuff that we should be doing, which is getting union density from 10 to 20% or whatever it is. Um, and that's another misuse in, in, if you ask me, you know, like, I, I don't think the kind of universalism that I'm interested in is not the homogenizing kind of universalism, right? We don't have to all have the exact same needs or whatever. We just all have to fight for our different needs together. That's the universalism I'm interested in. Thank you. Thank you so much for that answer, Ola Um, Do you, did you want to go back to the original thread about, do you have a question for us or should we talk about, the thing that I love about your work is that you have such a trenchant analysis and a power analysis that's so important for this moment, but you don't stop with that. And I think that that's the place where we can see your scholarship meets action and meets political organizing, which is that the second half of the argument is about how to build solidarity and what is the antidote to elite capture and how do we fix that through organizing visions, through ideas, through how to build bonds between people. Um, so I thought maybe we could pivot and talk about that piece, maybe spend the rest of our discussions on talking about antidotes. That's that's perfect actually, because it, it points to two of the questions that I had for you all. Um, so I'll just combine them a little bit now, but one thing I really wanted to um, hear you all respond to was um, on a kind of short time scale, like how is it that you've been able to get this kind of wall to wall vision of Rutgers worker organizing? How is it that you've been able to build that out? Because I think a lot of people, a lot of people I talk to really aspire to doing that kind of thing at their campuses and can't imagine it working. So how is it that you've been able to get as far as you've gotten on that? And in and the second part of the question is, you know, where could that take us? What role could, you know, Rutgers AAUP have in a resurgent higher ed labor movement, uh, maybe even a resurgent labor movement more broadly than higher ed? Like what do you think, what do you think the possibilities are for the kind of thing that y'all are doing at Rutgers. I can jump in and start us on that. And, and folks, again, please put your name on stack. And I am going to make an admission. I'm in Philly. We're in game five of the World Series. So I have my also on game five. It's the last home game. It's first time in like 15 years. So I'm sorry about that. But uh, but um, first, I want to like like flag that there are predecessors to us. Um, so, and, and two are important. So the New York unions were established from the beginning and there was a lot of fighting in the sixties and seventies, but both the CUNY P Professional Staff Congress and SUNY United University Professionals are both close to wall to wall. Um, and um, so that's an important thing to flag. And then also the CWA, Communication Workers of America has been doing these really interesting experiments 
throughout the South and now Southwest of wall-to-wall -wall organizing through United Campus Workers. Um, and so they're, they started in Tennessee and Texas, and they have chapters throughout the South in Georgia, in Virginia, in, um, 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 but, and then also the Southwest um, in, um, in Oklahoma, and then in the Southwest in um, um, Arizona and uh, Colorado most recently. And their goal is to build wall to wall. The difference for them is that they don't have collective bargaining rights. So they have not bargained a contract in any of those institutions yet. Or, um, but I, I think for us, you know, we're still struggling with this. It's a lot of work. It's really hard to build, um, especially the, the goal we've been having is try to build um, across job category to build an industrial or wall to wall union at Rutgers recognizing that we have a layered history that precedes us of multiple unions, something like 18 different collective bargaining units um, at Rutgers representing the 20, 21,000 um, unionized work, workers. And so that means that building wall to wall means building across multiple organizations um, and building, um, and, and it's been beautiful. And I think the way we jump started it in particular was, um, that we, I mean, it, there'd already been, there'd always been a coalition of Rutgers unions and Patrick Nolan's not here, but I want to just flag that he played a big role in establishing the coalition of Rutgers unions. I think when the pandemic hit, we recognized our union and then other unions recognized that it was both in, in Naomi Klein terms, both a moment of disaster capitalism, but also a moment of opportunity. Um, the university was going to use it. They were going to use it to punish the most vulnerable workers. And that's what they've always done. And we also saw it as an opportunity to build um, a solid, solidaristic network of workers on campus. And so we got out in front. We started calling meetings on the weekly as soon as the pandemic hit. We'd also been hearing our union more than other unions because we're the faculty union. And so administration came to us first. We'd been hearing about the layoffs they were planning, thousands of dining service workers, low wage, largely women and people of color. Um, and also adjunct faculty. Um, and so we started meeting as all of the unions. And from our vantage, the leadership of our union, what we saw was that faculty, particularly tenure track faculty, have been the ones that have been in a different sense, the most captured by management, right? The most pulled towards the managerial prerogatives and the most pulled away from a wall-to-wall -wall vision of how to uh, reimagine higher ed, particularly tenured, more privileged. And so we saw this as a moment to say, hey, why don't we get out in front, put forward our own vision of how to respond to the pandemic, a people's response to the pandemic that makes all of us sacrifice in order to keep the most vulnerable whole, right? And so that plan was this work share program that, you know, it's controversial, it was hard to do, but the idea was faculty will go into a work share program, they will furlough, they will go into the state system, we were able to keep most everyone whole, and they will do that to protect the jobs of the staff, the jobs of adjunct faculty, and also the uh, win important extensions for grad workers. And so that's what we aim to do. It was built on the idea of solidarity and a wall-to-wall -wall vision of coalition building at the university among all workers. And it didn't work perfectly. Two unions that were heavily threatened by the administration, had to break rank with us and move towards um, deals that kept them as safe as possible. And they weren't good deals. And those were um, were the dining service and dorms workers, as well as workers in the healthcare system. Um, but the majority of us were able to hold together. And I think it built a new way of working together. And so <clears throat> it's not perfect and it's been hard. Um, but I think that pandemic offered us a possibility and an opportunity to build collectively across. And, and the last thing I'll say about what's really hard about this work is that the institution is extremely hierarchical and the, every university is and our university is. And what's really hard is not recreating the hierarchies of the institution in the work we're trying to do as brothers and sisters building a, a workers coalition and a union movement. And so like and that happens all the time and it's sometimes it's invisible and sometimes you don't even know you're doing it because you know it's a set of cultural practices that you've been born into particularly if you're tenured faculty. And so um, for us, um, that's 
part of what the struggle is. And that's never going to be clean. It's always going to be a fight and it's always going to be work. But and I should shut up and let others jump in. But I think that's how we got a jump start on it. It was the pandemic and the possibility there. And the Phillies just in the home run, one one. Sorry. So I think we have no Ian on that. Um, I wanted to add one thing too. Todd is very modest, but another thing that I know that Todd did to help build the union coalition was just a series of meetings. You know, meetings with the many different job categories within the union really doing that work again of underlining your point of listening. And I think that if I was to say one thing about organizing and its tension with theory or with intellectual practice is that the way we're trained is that we fix things by talking, by explaining, but the core of organizing is listening. And I watched Todd do that work along with other people in the union. So thinking about all the different constituencies within our union, holding them up and ultimately helping to re along with Becky and others uh, to rewrite our bylaws, to provide representation to all the different job categories and constant talking, but listening to the other unions, thinking about how to coordinate contracts. So WorkShare showed a true basis of solidarity, not in speech, but in action, but thinking about what the needs were of all these different people inside a 19,000 member coalition. And that was an enormous amount of emotional labor. And I would honestly call it care work. So I think that that piece too, about you know, what, how, how do you actually build a coalition? A lot of that is you know, talking and listening, especially listening to the other members and being willing to give things up. That matters too and to think about how to coordinate our contracts, not based only on our narrow interests, but to rethink it in terms of multiple players. So I think Ian is on stack. Thanks, Donna. I don't have a ton to say. Uh, in addition, uh, thank you, Fami, for being here. I'm Ian Gavigan. I'm a grad student uh, at Rutgers in the History Department of New Brunswick and uh, also an executive counselor with our union. And what I wanted to raise uh, were two things I think speak to this, um, the question of scaling up that I think Femi posed to us. Um, so uh, one is I just wanna uh, give, a, give a shout out to Donna, our host tonight, who's part of a slate of uh, industrial union minded um, uh, union leaders from around the country who actually ran for and won four out of the six contested seats on the AUP national board this year. Uh, and so our very own Donna Merch is now on the leadership of, of the only national labor, the only national union that uh, exclusively rents, uh, represents higher ed workers. Um, and uh, it's a complicated process. Uh, it's a fraught one, um, but it's certainly a step in that direction. And I want to just note that we did that we waged this campaign in coalition uh, not just with other pe people from other job categories, but with, with uh, unions from around the country. And I think that gets to the to the kind of other second point, um, which is slightly broader, which is that our union has taken uh, the initiative and leadership of a national coalition of higher ed unions called Higher Ed Labor United, which we um, uh, founded uh, in conjunction with several, uh, with some uh, scholars new to for higher education and, and a handful of other very engaged higher ed unions um last summer and i think that what we're trying to do now is, is take this vision national and people are responding um it's uh you know the the work is always going to be on the ground in the locals but there needs to be connective tissue there needs to be a federation that can unite us and and we're building that work um so it's also a little bit of a plug if you're interested in that work uh, uh you know re reach out to todd or me or naomi williams uh who are all very involved in this so yeah as someone said in the chat wall to wall coast to coast uh that's uh that's our motto that's what we're doing um and yeah so happy that we can integrate uh your insights uh femi into into what we're doing can i just say one quick thing on this i i really think we need to impress it on ourselves that there is no other way forward than organizing wall to wall in our higher ed institutions there is no way to win there is no way to challenge the forces arrayed against us um, in our institutions if we organize in silos. And that's what's been going on for the last 50 years. And frankly, we've been getting our ass kicked, right? And so if we're really honest about this and we're really honest about what we're looking at, 
faculty, tenured faculty organizing for, around the interests of tenured faculty is a losing hand. Grad workers also organizing only for grad worker issues is a losing hand. But uh, recognizing the problem, which is an, a structural institutional problem and is beyond the academy, and organizing in response to that problem, which means wall to wall and with our undergrad students in alliance and their families, that is the only way. And if we could actually do that, I think to Femi, a point you made earlier, we could actually help reimagine labor writ large, right? This is one of the best sectors to build industrial forms because it's geographically located, right? There's a physical reality to higher ed and to our universities and colleges that many other sectors no longer have or don't have in the same way that gives us real opportunity. And so one, we can't win any other way. So there's no other way forward but to deal with the problems here, both at the local level and nationally, which um, uh, Ian was just talking about. And then also, it's probably one of the best places to experiment as we reimagine what the labor movement does moving forward. Thank you so much for that. That's um, just really, really powerful. I second what many of us have been saying in the chat. So important. Well, it's 824. So we're getting to the end of our hour and a half. It's gone by so quickly. But Femi, why don't you take us out? What are your thoughts? Well, I think Becky is on stack. So why don't, Sorry, why Becky. don't we go that way? I will absolutely yield my time. Uh, I, uh, I'm just proud to be working on this on this greater vision. And I, I would love Femi's closing thoughts. I wish I could say, I wish I could say Todd's closing thoughts again, because <laughs> I'm, you know, I, I feel, I feel strongly, you know, as maybe the question implied a little bit, you know, there's that there's that not only should we reject this kind of view of academia, we're always, you know, dumping on our participation in academia as an institution, being very sad and apologetic that we're academics. You know, obviously there are problems with academia, but I think the better response is exactly um, what Todd and Ian and Donna and all of you are up to. You know, I think it's it's much better for us to think about the university as a site of opportunity, not just for organizing to defend ourselves and our working conditions, but through that and on the other side of that to defending the working class from its working conditions and you know winning what we can at the level of the labor movement and uh, you know the i think that's what the other side of wall to wall and coast to coast looks like you know i think the labor movement has an interest in us succeeding at doing this and i you know i just hope we can keep going and I'm glad that we've gotten to have this conversation about what you all are doing and what others of us could be doing and um that's all I have to say thank you go Phillies <laughs> thank you so much Femi this was absolutely amazing and you know what we do have three minutes Becky since you're the president of our union and I know you want to keep us focused on our contract campaign, take us out. All right, no pressure after all the amazing, amazing uh, things people have said. I'll just say one thing, which is that I think what Todd said about this being the only way we can win, this is the antidote to the mentality that's that's imposed on us that presents us with a series of false choices that I have to fight with my siblings in Newark and Camden, because if if I eat, they can't eat. And if they eat, I can't eat. And we can only fight that by working together. And that includes faculty, staff, grad workers, undergrads, understanding that the only way to reject this sort of false set of choices is first to understand them and then to work together to build power. So 
Um, we're doing that. The next way we're doing that is through Strike School, which fantastic feedback in the chat for that. People who've gone through Strike School, it's just two hour and a half sessions, and we're really building something powerful in there. And you'll be with folks from across our campuses and across our job categories in that space. So um, I, I want to thank Donna for bringing us all together and Femi for um, all the work that you're doing and for being part of this conversation. Thank you so much, Becky. That was a perfect way to end. And I guess I'll be seeing all of you in strike school. Good Thanks, night. So much. Thanks all. Thank you, Femi. Thank, thank you, Femi. And thank you, everybody. It's a fantastic okay. conversation. Thank you.